Welcome, everybody, once again to Bookish, the virtual program on authors, thinkers, and the literary life, brought to you by the Southern California News Group and the Bay Area News Group. I'm Sam Dunn, the senior editor of Special Projects here at SCNG, and a book nerd and an author myself. I want to say thank you to our Reader Reward subscribers and to all of you who've made our ongoing virtual program so popular. Um, you know, by the way, if you're a Reader Rewards member attending tonight, you're automatically entered to win a $50 gift card from Barnes & Noble, which is going to come in really handy because you're going to have a lot of great book recommendations by the end of the show, guaranteed. Uh, now, it's my pleasure to introduce our bookish host, the writer, performer, and radio commentator. You've heard her work on NPR's Morning Edition and This American Life. She's a contributing editor at The Atlantic and host of the syndicated daily radio Minute, The Lowdown on Science. Her many books include The Mad Woman in the Volvo and her most recent book, The Mad Woman and the Roomba. Beaming to us from Pasadena, please welcome our favorite mad woman, Sandra Singlo. Hello, darling. Hello, darling. It's so good to see you as we turn into spring. Um, yes. Today's theme is humor, but I think with our fantastic authors, it's going to be so fast moving. It's kind of like the ideal versus the real. I do. Does that resonate with you? You know, I'm just here for anything. So talk away. <laughs> so, and we're going to mix things up a bit. So I'm going to bring on our pal, Annabelle Gerwich, before I even do her 30 second download. Hello, <laughs> Annabelle, can you unmute? Hello. Hello, girlfriend. So we've known each other, the three of us. We're longtime colleagues, longtime lady writers of a certain kind of renown. So it, you know, we would say our lives should be like the Nancy Myers movie, Something's Gotta Give. Right? Yes. Yes. Can you set it up? Okay. Funny, funny you should mention that because in my book, You're Leaving When, which, by the way, I like to say about this book, I can't afford the furniture on my book cover. Uh, <laughs> things have not turned out to be exactly as we thought they would be. So what happened in, in, the, in the book, I do write about how uh, somehow we, uh, and when we say we, I mean I, internalized the message that when I became a, a midlife person, my life would be not unlike Diane Keaton's, who stars in Something's Gotta Give, who she happens to be the most celebrated playwright on Broadway. She has a home on the Hamptons. She has a piano terre in the city. And her house in the Hamptons is like, it's it's so warm and cozy. It's like she's living inside a baguette. Every, <laughs> every, every sofa is like stuffed like a cannoli, although it's probably filled with money, soft little bills of uh, soft hundred dollar bills. And, <laughs> Not one, but two suitors after her. Why say she's got Jack Nicholson, a sort of Lothario, who's wealthy, of course, and rather dashing, who's in love with her. But there's also Keanu Reeves, who's not a Lothario, but is also dashing. And he's a doctor, a hottie, a handsome doctor. And they both are falling in love with her. What can she do? Oh, these well, that is exactly like our lives, or yes. is it not? And I'm going to pause. I'm going to sell, send Samantha Dunn away. Stop. I'm going to do your 30 second download. And then we're going to get into what life might really be like of the real. Okay. So let me, while Annabelle hovers on her screen, looking gorgeous. Here's your 30 second download. Annabelle Gerwich is an actress, activist, and author. Her books include Wherever You Go, There They Are, stories about my family you might relate to, New York Times bestseller, I See You Made an Effort, compliments, indignities, and survival stories from the edge of 50. You say tomato, I say shut up, co-authored with Jeff Kahn, her ex, it's safe to say, and fired also a Showtime comedy special. Gerwich was HBO's not necessarily the news's anchor, co-host of TBS's Dinner on a Movie, and has been a regular commentator on NPR. She's written for The New Yorker, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, McSweeney Salon, and more. Tiny Victories is her new and noteworthy Apple podcast, and you're leaving when Adventures in Downward Mobility, right there, hilarious, must get it, just came out. Okay, welcome again, Annabelle. So, you just by the way, Sandra, I think it's interesting that you're down to your, your uh, NPR minute, science minute. <laughs> <laughs> And you know how, I mean, if anything says downward mobility and how our lives have been reduced. <laughs> In a 
will be 10 seconds and just uh, like a gif if I even knew what that was. But of course, I'm not <laughs> if enough to know what that is. Yes. But to you, okay, so your life, yeah. like Diane Keaton's or not, as you describe in your hilarious book. Okay, so what's missing from that picture? Where are we uh, at, Annabelle? All of those things are missing from those this picture. I mean, you know, I wrote this particular book um, as a as a as a chronicle of, of course, I I'm not just my life, but this idea of the disappearance of the middle class, and it just so happens I'm a poster child for it. And you know, um, this these stories are they are they're midlife stories uh, of uh, you know uh, if i was if i was a different not a comedy writer if i was uh, love and troubles claire derader i would be it would call it a reckoning but no one calls a comedic <laughs> book a reckoning but it is a reckoning it's a comedic reckoning and you know it's all these stories about where you know i have found myself as a divorced woman of a certain age child gone off into the world uh, parents left me and uh you know the kind of things i always th saw myself like having my sister uh sign me up for a thing called a uh, lingerie box where panties and bras were getting delivered to my house they were showing up on my doorstep every week because she was so afraid i was going to end up alone as i am now during covid <laughs> <laughs> right, and I, I think what you're saying is exactly right. It, it's not it's not the soft focused romance story and the the gray divorce. I went through a divorce myself, and yeah. you you kind you rent out your your house, and then you have homeless people living with you or the unhoused, I'm and you learn at... about them, and you like so. But it is also how let you manage to make it all hilarious, which makes it an amazing read. Well, I, I, I really appreciate that. I mean, that's always the thing that, you know, interests you and me both, right? Is how do we, you know, make this, you know, make it work as, as Tim <laughs> said, and actually you're in my book in the very, uh, the, the, in the introduction, uh, Sasha and I are having lunch together and Sasha orders a lamb kebab, but I'm on an austerity budget and I order a little radish salad, but then <laughs> I, I think I write that I, I attack Sasha, Sandra Sing Lowe's lamb kebab, ferocity that scared us both, I think I could dare say. <laughs> but we were doing, you know, hacks of midlife of being artists and creative bohemians yeah. of like, um, giving uh, public schools, living in like, like we we just found ourselves like we all thought we would be kind of Lori Anderson living in a cool place, and, and then we were there. We were in in Silver Lake. Um, right. um, I think. I mean, you know. Also, I mean, I'm I'm I am really interested in sort of where we exist in the landscape of economics in terms of history, and you know, for people who are just younger than the boomer generation, so you're, you're like Gen X or cusp, cuspers, particularly people like us who are also parents of Gen Z, we're in this very fragile economic position just by virtue of the years we've been working and being born. Uh-oh, this is not funny, but, um, but it's a hilarious way that it's playing out, you know, in, 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 in changing our lives. And I, I, I am really interested in that as a trend. And then, you know, one of the chapters in the book is about writing about the way we are the Calgon take me away generation sold this idea that there's a, uh, a handbag, a, a bra, a brow, uh, a bathcation that's going to save and change everything. And I think, you know, I'm not immune to this stuff. You know, I write about falling in love with a poof which is a pillow um, that was advertised in a Roche Beaubois store. If you don't know who Roche Beaubois is, you know, that's the designer. Like, it's like the couches are so low to the ground and they're colorful. Like every crayon in the world was melted upon them. And <laughs> it, it, I mean, and you, you 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 if you bought these things you 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 can't just get up and down from them it, it's only for people who have outsourced every activity including going to the bathroom and i fell in love with this poof and then i went on this like stupid rabbit hole quest to find the poof that was going to change my life i mean it's that was uh i'm i'm in my 
I'm in my living room. By the way, I write that, you know, it's like there's a, uh, um, a herd of alpacas grazing in my living room. I just, I've never done this, but I just want to show you something. Like, um, lean into your screens, people. I'm going to lean, just, this is, it's really embarrassing, but like, I don't make this stuff up. I oh. really, I have all this. Oh, that's <laughs> adorable. Oh, it's like I'm 10 years, I'm two years old. I, <laughs> I'm like a furry. This is really embarrassing. <laughs> oh, you only saw it on bookish. Okay. So what I'm, I love about your book and your writing is that you write about real things that a lot of people experience, but with such joy. And one of the themes of your book is to say yes or yes. It's if you get an invite, even if it's from your shoe repair place, you're gonna to go to that party and you're gonna say yes. So because you've said yes, that's the perfect segue yes. into the, the next piece where you're gonna do a little bit of acting for us because Annabelle is also a great writer, a, an activist and also an actress. So stay for a moment. No, Annabelle's book, Hold It Up Again, we'll have another slide, is, hold it up. Uh, you're leaving when Adventures in Downward Mobility, get it, it's out now, it's hilarious. Okay, so Annabelle's gonna stay on screen. It's the first time we're trying this on bookish. Okay, so I'm gonna do a 30 second download and then a little dramatic reading. Okay, hang on, okay. So. Thank you. Our next guest after Annabelle is David Rose. Okay. David Rose is a, okay, this is from his bio, so forgive me. Is it you? I'd like to do a British accent, but I, I probably won't. Is a two decade veteran of the kind of reassuringly expensive literary magazine you might leave on your coffee table in a playful effort to intimidate your friends with your intellectual acumen. That's a long sentence. He opened and ran the US office of the London Review of Books until 2011 and followed that with a five year stint as publisher of Laffin's Quarterly. He is currently chief marketing officer of bookshop.org, yes, which sold more than $60 million. I believe this is the translation of worth of books in its first year and has so far generated more than 12 million in net revenue, 12 million for independent bookstores. Rose is also the creator of They Call Me Naughty Lola and sexually, I'm more of a Switzerland. Both are cullings from the personal ads of the London Review of Books, the personal ads people, from which we now have a 60 second excerpt. Bold, short, fat, and ugly male, 53, six short-sighted woman with tremendous sexual appetite, box number 9612. I put the phrase five-headed bisexual orgy into this ad to increase my Google hits. <laughs> really, I'm looking for someone who likes hearty soups and jigsaws of kittens. Woman 62, Berwick, box number 7862. An ancient Czech legend says that any usurper who places the crown of St. Wenceslas on his head is doomed to die within a year. During World War II, Reinhard Heinrich, the Nazi governor of the puppet protectorate of Bohemia and Moravia, secretly wore the crown, believing himself to be a great king. He was assassinated less than a year later by the Czech resistance. I have many more stories like this one. I will tell you them all, and we will make love. Man 47, box number 6859. I'll see you at the LRB Singles Night. I'll be the one breathing heavily and stroking my thighs by the art books. Asthmatic, varicose female, 93, 6M, 230, with enough poof in him to push me uphill to the post office. This is not a euphemism. Box number 4632. Mature gentleman, 62, aged well, noble, grey locks, fit and active, sound mind and unfaced by the fickle demands of modern society, seeks. 
Damn it, I have to pee again. Box number 4143. <laughs> Thank you, Annabelle Gerwich and Friar McAllister, my old man, as they would say in the Johnny Mitchell song. Thank you so much. Welcome, David. I'm sorry. You boy, oh boy. I only wish I, I only wish I made you guys do even more work. That's if if I have any regrets, it's that I didn't send you a longer script and longer introduction. <laughs> so much so many it was hard to call okay so david david colon and you're you you're one of the people who your author photo set up a stir alone so you are the bad boy from london coming here and and uh, joining us so okay so we're obviously a very important book show bookish yeah. and the london <laughs> review very important so can you tell can you take us back a little bit to in the 1990s when you started the personal ads in the London. Oh man, we're going back. We're, we're, we're going back in the time machine here, boy oh boy. I think it was, um, I think it was 1998. I started at the London Review of Books and I'd previously worked on a car magazine. So I was well equipped as you can imagine. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, side note, I've never driven a car either. So you know, <laughs> don't expect any level of literacy because uh, I worked on a magazine. Um, but I, uh, you know, it was it was an attempt to kind of carve out space for myself because I was selling the ads. And of course, you know, if you're on the business side and you know, you need something to sell, otherwise you're not going to get paid. And so the idea was, okay, maybe I'll start a little Lonely Hearts column. And, um, you know, it, we put a little notice in the magazine and it seemed that, that you know, maybe we get a few responses, but we got exactly one response. And it was the weirdest thing I'd ever read in my life at that time. It was um, this guy, described himself as a 67 year old disaffiliated flaneur jacked up on Viagra looking for a contortionist who could play the trumpet. And I just thought, I mean, you know, I was younger in those days, obviously. And so I'm reading this thing thinking, you know, I, and I just thought, I'm going to, I'm going to publish this because I know that he sent it as some kind of critique of what we were doing. It was like somehow beneath the tomba of the magazine. And I thought, I'm going to publish that. And, so, <laughs> I mean, and he got some great responses and the whole thing just, Snowball from there, it was um, every two weeks a, sh a showcase for the wacky and the weird. Yeah, they're like small haikus that, and that was not what you expected, um, but it kind of reflects the readership. And maybe we'll do something like that on Bookish, but I, I think so. <laughs> oh, I advise you we'll not fire to. Me. We'll fire me if I even invite you. Do you know what? You, you will need years oh. of therapy to get out of it. <laughs> See, she's, oh. on, she's oh. unmuted. Uh-uh, she's unmuted herself. But the contortionist, <laughs> that's, we could do that. I don't know. It's like, okay. <laughs> so, but I, I guess, Another question I have is, do you think the UK versus the US, it seems in reading these, and that's not even the whole of your work, but so hilarious, so so irreverent in, in times when we think of ourselves as sporty, cute, this and that. Do you think there's a difference between the UK and the US? Do you, do you think that we would, if we tried to start that here, David, do you think we would have contortionists and trumpet players? Or yeah, I mean, with... you know, I can speak very directly to this because I, I've now lived in this country for a very long time. And so I, I've seen both sides of the, uh, the hemisphere. Um, and, and I think the difference is less to do with the personalities that are behind them and more to do with the kind of the medium that it's in. So the analog on this country would be the New York Review of Books. Um, you know, if look at the New York Review of Books versus the London Review of Books. You know, the, 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 the London element um, has a, a nice vein of silliness in it. And I think, you know, that, you know, humor on this side of the country doesn't really have that kind of silliness in it. Like pure, just childish silliness. Puns, dad jokes are very, very uh, popular over there in the UK. Over, over here, uh, you know, I, I you know, I like to think it's a bit more cerebral, uh, the, the, the humor. I have a lot of admiration for American comedy, but I think in the UK, it's very much um, rooted in the playground. And when you combine that with a kind of an intellectual ecosystem, it's, you know, an interesting contradiction. And I think that's where the playfulness came out. You know, I think that's where we get guys like Lego Eric. And <laughs> <laughs> it is so though disturbing though, to read these where even though the self, um, the descriptions like smells of peas, weird <laughs> shoe size, they are oddly attractive in a way because people sound really funny. Like they would be a great person to have 
a pint with or or some peas with or whatever so yeah I, I think it was that lack of seriousness it, it's you, you know the I, I think the British do it very well where they don't tend to take themselves as seriously you know they understand that everything is kind of absurd and there's nothing more absurd than the dating game but you know peculiarly you know, the, the, the brain really is the largest and most accessible erogenous zone. So I, I think it kind of dials right in, you know, to that kind of mentality. It's like, there's something about a sense of humor that kind of creates a spark. And I think that that's, that's very appealing about these things. So to pivot, if we might, because it's a book show to books, um, I think that irreverence and, and the theme of our show is the real versus the ideal or the ideal versus the real. Do you find as a purveyor of books in the London Review of Books and also bookshop.org, do you feel that there's sometimes there's books that we say, of course I'm reading this book, or you you are publicly saying you're reading a certain book, and then there are books that we actually are reading but we're embarrassed <laughs> to say that we are. I've been saying I've been reading Robert Carroll for the last 10 years. <laughs> 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 you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. Definitely. I, I, I don't know if I have any uh, guilty pleasures as such. You know, I'm, I'm loud and proud about everything I read. Although I read, you know, very little. You know, I'm kind of embarrassed at how little I do read. I, I you know, I tend to not have much time for it. But I, you know, I, if I've picked a book up and I'm, I'm reading it, I usually find something of value in there, even if it's absurd. Um, I, you know, and I. I, I recently um, reread Jaws. I don't know if you've ever read the, the novel Jaws. No, I haven't. I didn't even know don't. it was a novel, but I, I love like a Rosemary's Baby or a James Michener's Hawaii, or like I, I love all the big blockbuster books. I don't well, even I, I had a Robert, crazy Robert idea. Benchley, right? Yeah, 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 that's right. Pete, Peter, Peter Benchley, Peter Benchley. Peter Benchley, Robert Benchley. <laughs> well, I, I, I had this ludicrous idea a couple of years ago that I wanted to, I wanted to write a prequel to Jaws. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to write Jaws without the shark. <laughs> I thought, all right, I'm going to do it. But well, first of all, I need to do some research on this town. And so I, I read the book and, oh, man. <laughs> like it has. You were going to set it in Amityville before the shark comes? Yeah. Yeah, and, oh. and it, the whole, it was going to be a show. It was going to be called Amity, and it was going to be about the town before the shark arrived. <laughs> you know, and, <laughs> you know I, I, I was really into the idea for about six weeks, and, and then I found something else to distract myself. But in the meantime, I, I read the book, and man, you think how many units that book sold. I talk in units these days. How many units that book sold? And it has plausibly, and I don't mean any disrespect. I don't mean any disrespect. It has plausibly the worst sex scene of any book I've ever read in my life. It is tremendous in its badness, the sex scene that takes place in Jaws. And it it, it kind of made me kind of like really fascinate on this scene. Okay, in the, in David, slow down, slow down. This right, is a right. family show, but right. you are a guest. So if in PG terms, like, I'm well, not going to get into it. Sex scene, I, what, what makes a bad, I think all sex scenes in literature, it's like just awkward and it's not, it's like what dancing about architecture. It's like, do, does anyone want to read? Well, I mean, I mean, what makes it bad is it's a man writing it. So that's what makes it bad. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, if, if we're going to dial down on the pros and I don't want to give any spoiler alerts. I don't know. Have you guys seen Jaws? I don't know. It was a movie. Um, it's a great movie. I don't want to no, give anything. No, else. my friend, do not attack. Well, I'm sorry. I'm it, American. It's a great movie. It, yeah, it, I mean, everything goes on, but in the book, there's like so much more that happens in the book. And in the book, I don't want to give anything away, but in the book, there's a scene in the, mo in the motel between two key characters. And the woman in that scene is thinking how this gentleman pees like a horse. <laughs> oh. Okay, well, Samantha, I'm gonna get fired. That's all I'm giving you. That's all I'm giving you. That's all I'm giving you. Okay, okay. Oh that's it. my God. Oh my that's God. As, all right. That's as racy as Samantha it's is like. His author photo alone sent the marketing that, department into it. <laughs> and now, now, now it's okay. So before we let you go, and we will, David, because once again, you've scandalized another room of nice book. <laughs> okay, bookshop.org. Can you? Tell our viewers a little bit about what bookshop.org is and why they should buy all their books on that. Yeah, so bookshop.org is, if imagine being able to buy books online 
Think about that possibility for a second. Right, you buy books online, but instead of sending the money to you know the most conspicuously large company in America, the money goes back to the high streets. Like that, we send thirty percent of the list price of every book bought. If you're affiliated to a bookstore, that thirty percent goes to the bookstore. So that's that's how we keep bookstores open. We send the money back. Book Bookshop is a platform that enables small independent bookstores to compete in the e-commerce environment. Uh, so we use that company's own tools against it. Uh, it's pretty awesome. If you haven't seen Bookshop, go and check it out. Everybody gets to have a page on Bookshop. Um, everybody gets to be an affiliate on Bookshop and list the books they love and sell the books and enjoy booksellers. So I encourage you all to do it. Thank you so much, David. You, you are a delight. And after we brush ourselves off, and there is Samantha. We, we do have a question from Alice Taylor. For oh David. She says, David, one of my fondest memories is the night my poetry writing group did a Naughty Lola throwdown. <laughs> created their no Naughty Lolas and read them. Unfortunately, that night we had a Swedish born poet joining us. She put us all to shame with her descriptive naughtiness. She wants to know, does your latest book address these international differences in ability? <laughs> well, I, I've retired from writing on account of not being very good at it. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it, yeah, it, it's, it's an, it, it, was, it was really interesting the way they took off over here, actually. Um, and I think the second book, uh, which came out a couple of years later, that actually came out in the US first. They, they were actually much more popular on this side than they were in the UK. So that's an interesting thing I always thought. That doesn't answer your question at all, but. You know. well, that, that's, uh, it's the perfect, it's the perfect answer of like <laughs> the ideal versus the real. The ideal is the UK and the real is the US and we will love that. So. It versus ego is how I like to frame it. <laughs> Thank you so much, David Rose. A uh, pleasure, pleasure, pleasure. Um, Bookshop.org um, and the books, they call me Naughty Lola and sexually I'm more of a Switzerland are his compilations from the London Review of Books Personals. Okay, next up, we have Megan Down coming to us. Um, and here's the 30 second download. Um, hello, and there she is, okay. Megan Down is the author of five books, including The Problem with Everything, My Journey Through the New Culture Wars, which the New York Times named a notable book of 2019. Her last book, and I don't mind saying I reviewed it for the New York Times, and I was happy to do it because it's awesome. Her last book was a collection of original essays, The Unspeakable and Other Subjects of Discussion, the winner of the 2015 Penn Center USA Award for Creative Nonfiction. She's the editor of the New York Times bestseller, Selfish, Shallow, and Self-Absorbed, 16 writers on the decision not to have kids. Her other books include the essay collection, My Misspent Youth, the novel, The Quality of Life Report, and Life Would Be Perfect If I Lived in That House, a memoir. Down has written for numerous magazines, The New Yorker, The Atlantic, Harper's Vogue, and contributed to Morning Edition, Marketplace, This American Life. Her column ran the LA Times op-ed page for more than a decade. She's a national treasure. Hello, welcome, Megan. Hello, it's nice so, to see you. It's so good to see you. And you're in New York now for a few more minutes before you come to LA. Always for a few more minutes. I'm right on the edge. <laughs> Although I, I have to say, I, I uh, like Annabelle, I have my, um, my, my furry, fluffy home decor. Oh my God. I have it here with me, so it gets very difficult to uh, leave, leave my apartment. I have my cabbage sandals from Meow yeah. Wolf. It's really okay. hard to see. We're gonna start just holding up the objects of our mm -hmm. desire, which I think is the perfect, the perfect lead into my first question for you. Cause I thought since we are stuck in, in our quarters of the pandemic during the quarantine, I would like to touch back for, for viewers of um, life would be perfect if I lived in that house. Your, your memoir of a couple of years ago about living and, and sort of you live in New York, LA, also Nebraska. Can you just, <laughs> now that we're stuck in our homes, can you kind of flash back a little bit to when you got the inspiration to write that book? Well, I hate to travel, but I love to move. <laughs> I actually, nothing uh, gets me more like jazz, galvanized, anim animated, whatever word you want to use. Like I love, I actually love packing up my stuff. I can pack up my entire house, hold. I mean, it's just me usually in like a weekend and move. And I love, even if it's a rental, I love being in a new space. Like I love making that trip to Target and getting a new shower curtain. There's something <laughs> so, there's just something so hopeful about getting a new shower curtain, you know? 
so uh, yeah, I just, I always loved houses. My mother was a ho house freak. We moved a lot when I was a kid. My mother would like want to take walks only at night so she could see into people's houses, you know, with the lights on. So um, yeah, I just, there's something about space and the, the, the way we define our interior space, especially that um, really, I just, I can't get enough of it, but it's an expensive habit, uh, unfortunately. Well, going back to the Target thing, and I, I think you said Target, which makes sense. Ikea can be a little bit too stressful because so you burst into tears. It's too big, right? Right. And even, you know, I was moving around a lot even before. Well, actually, when were, when were my Target days? You know, it wasn't, Ikea is like too far. It's like too much. That's too much of a production. You've got to drive. You got to get on the freeway. You got to drive there. I don't know. There's something, something about Target. It's a little, little low key. So, yes. So, okay, but you're you're a unusual writer, I, I would say, or in the, the, you've, you've lived in New York, you've lived in Los Angeles, but you have a fondness for the Midwest also. So the prairie, yes. The prairie. the prairie. So geographically, are there different resonances of these different places for you? Mm, resonances. I yeah. know, I know. I, no, it's hard to avoid. It's hard to avoid the word. It's like reckoning and resonance have collided and that that is the defining sort of collusion of our of our moment a reckoning with resonance i i'm um, really happy people are going to get their money's worth which is free for the reckoning of the collusion and the resonance right yes, there yes yes um so yeah i always had a big little house in the prairie fetish when I was a kid I I made my mother like sew me a sunbonnet I made my parents put like extra mattresses under my under my bed so I could have a little ladder like a little step ladder so I could climb up the way Laura Ingalls did and <laughs> her sister and go to bed um so yeah when I was I lived in New York uh I, after college I moved to New York just very sort of you know, ordinary aspiring writer kind of editorial world. Uh, and I, I started running out of money in a big way, uh, specifically not earning enough. And so when I was 29, I decided to move to Lincoln, Nebraska, really for, for no reason. Um, and uh, it was, uh, it was, it turned out, it turned out well, I think. I stayed there for almost four years and I wrote a novel, but yeah, I love the flat, I love like one tree and a big flat space and a big sky. I'm not a big fan of trees. I think there's like too many of them as a rule. So uh, I, I just like, I like, I like the big storms and I like dramatic weather. Uh, so that was, that was all fun. But I, I you know, I, I wouldn't want to live there now. Every time I move someplace, I try to like keep a foothold in the old place, like I always think I'm going to start a writer's colony. I, you know, I, I left Nebraska thinking, oh, I'm going to buy buy a farm. I'm going to come back in like ten minutes, and I'm going to buy this like farm in the middle of nowhere and turn it into an artist colony. Uh, and I, I that that didn't it still hasn't happened. But so I, I think your 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 um, inflammatory comment about trees is the perfect segue way into the next question is like, so you begin your writing career as a personal essayist of kind of like talking about your, your life as a young woman and money and cities and whatever. And then you go trees and you go, well, I think there are too many trees, which then pivots into where you are at the moment of being of your incredible new podcast the unspeakable oh. which is also like it's kind of like so from personal essayist to unspeakable so can you can you just like talk a little bit about the term the unspeakable and and i i think it's terrific it's, it's so funny oh. and rubbing and like the unspeakable so what what makes something unspeakable yeah well so uh, the unspeakable was the name of one of my books the unspeakable which is an, an essay collection i uh, came out in 2014 and so I was just sort of interested in that case in writing essays. They were original essays, they were written for the book. They weren't like pieces that had appeared in magazines and that sort of thing. And I was kind of like interested in talking about the world, talking about experiences that are maybe dramatic or harrowing or sad or whatever it is, but that you don't necessarily become a better person in the end. Like, I think that's sort of this narrative that we cannot, there's another word, narrative, reckoning, resonance. Those are the three overused words. We'll get to nuance in a minute, but I've, uh, 
I've uh was it collusion somewhere in there also yeah, but collusion, I just kind of threw that in that's kind of okay. base folly actually so so this uh, is so, a story that that then you don't, you're not better at the end Right. So, so that was, that was one of the things I wanted to look at in the unspeakable. And I talked about a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of sort of subjects explored that, that might be considered taboo or that you're not supposed to talk about sort of thing. Uh, and then, yeah, the couple of years went by, I wrote, uh, I published another couple books and last summer as one does, I started a podcast. I'm the only person who started a podcast during the pandemic. As, as people will know. I also got a puppy, the only person who got a puppy. Uh, and I was trying to figure out what to call the podcast. Uh, and I, it just seemed like The Unspeakable was a, good, uh, a good, good name. It's an interview show. I talk to people uh, about subjects that mm, tend to be rendered taboo, I think, because they're not discussed in the right way. Um, it's not like these things shouldn't be discussed. It's just that too often the people that are in the rotation talking about them aren't quite getting it. Uh, so I have people like you, I have people like Annabelle, uh, and I have just people who are able to speak candidly and uh, with nuance. Uh, and that's- Yeah, the, the of and, and I think for those it. who have yet to hear it, but will be new to it, I think what I, what I, and I'm about to say resonate. So now I really look at my, my you can't stop. I do, I do like, resonate. I yeah. do resonate with, with women of kind of like, of I think particularly what is so like women are always supposed to do one thing or the other. So it's like, we are supposed to have children or not. If you have them, you're supposed to love them at all times, even though they can be annoying. So, um, and I have two children, they're 18 and 20. Um, so, so I think what I've uh, resonated with or enjoyed is how just for women to have a voice of whatever they're thinking and it can be all kinds of things. Mm, yeah, it's, it's, I have male guests as well. So it's not, uh, it's not, oh yeah, I've had, I've had many, many male guests. I had, I had Leon Weaseltier. I had Brett Stevens, New York Times columnist a few weeks ago. Uh, yeah, it's not, it's not a women, women centric show. However, I have noticed it for whatever reason in this sort of gestalt of heterodox free think people having these sort of wide ranging, um, you know, sort of complex conversations there are more men in that space uh space that's another one <laughs> uh, there are more men for some reason having these discussions and kind of uh kind of saying things that might get them in trouble on twitter uh i think that uh you know i don't want to make huge generalizations but i think for for a variety of reasons you may have fewer women wanting to uh stick their necks out so i've, I've gotten to the point where uh I don't, I don't care anymore if, if I'm, if people hate me, I'm, I've, I've moved past that. <laughs> well, it, it's always a fun conversation, always great, always new one. It, it's so interesting. To well, it's funny people. that you say that because now I, you know, all, uh, all writers, we start off wanting to have great literary careers, but what we really want to do is sell merch. Uh, so yeah. now, now the Unspeakable Podcast has, has official nuanced and I... <laughs> that's the slogan. And so anybody um the, the the podcast logo is on the back but there's there are shirts and mugs and baby onesies because okay. there's nothing nothing more nuanced than a baby and to get those we'll put it in the chat of the website samantha Dunn will put the website to go to to get this merch it's fantastic yes. to to subscribe to the podcast it's really fantastic and oh, i have um, fantastic guests and all of those things so okay so thank you so much time is too short as always thank you. megan okay and Megan's most recent book is The Problem with Everything, My Journey Through the New Culture Wars, and the podcast, The Unspeakables, is available everywhere. So, um, so thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, okay, last but not least, we bring on Joel Stein, and here's the 30-second download. Um, his bio is hilarious. So you love a writer bio on the website that... Uh, that begins with Joel Stein was not easy to work with on this bio, but I will go for, I'll skip the author photo, which was another issue for Joel Stein. Um, he was, Joel Stein was a staff writer and columnist for Time Magazine for 20 years, where he wrote 22 cover stories, columnists for Entertainment Weekly and the Los Angeles Times. His books include 
man-made colon a stupid quest for masculinity and in defense of elitism why i'm better than you and you're better than someone who didn't buy this book that's brilliant he taught at princeton wrote for several sitcoms and appeared as a talking head on i love the 80s and any other tv shows that invited him on okay wait for it there's no factual basis for his claim that his writing has saved millions of lives and destroyed many more marriages. Okay, <laughs> and on that note, you know what, actually I, I wanna read a couple of like, uh, Jimmy Kimmel says, I can think of no one more suited to defend elitism than Stein, a funny man with hands as delicate as a baby full of soft boiled eggs. Um, he's been called the Ted Nugent of elitism by Andy Borowitz of the New York Times. We could go on. Welcome, Joel. I, I am happy to be both last and least in this crowd. This is okay. very impressive. Okay. It's nice to meet you after you know years of my wife and I reading and, and listening to you. So uh, I'm just happy to meet you. Well, so many years, and I'm going to bring Samantha Dunn on with a, a, a huge Bring everyone story. back. Okay, yeah, bring everyone. Really. <laughs> okay, here she goes. So I, Joel, Joel, I don't even think you remember this, but it has bothered me since 1995. Sure. We were, we were it, truly, we were in New York. We were, you were dating. Thing. No, we weren't. I don't know. You were, I don't you were much younger. You were much younger. Otherwise, maybe. Anyhow, and we were going somewhere. We had been somewhere, and then we needed to go in the same general direction. And we shared a cab. I got out first, and I was fumbling for money. And you said, "Don't worry about it." So, Joel, I still owe you five bucks. Well, Sorry. I keep, uh, oddly enough, I keep a list of people that owe me money. Uh, sure no, it's, it sounds like an anti-Semitic trope, but it's just true. And uh, and I, <laughs> I, I do accrue interest at a pretty high rate. Right. So, yeah, $5. Yeah, that's $5. like... Okay, I'm well, going before I, he collects. It's about six Ethereum right now that I'm going to be having to take from you. So... <laughs> Do you take Dogecoin? Do we get that in Dogecoin by any chance? There's, I do not accept Dogecoin. Oh my God, this is so TMI at this point. But you know, I, I think we've just ticked the whole thing. The, no, whole the amount thing. of women in New York who I uh, paid for their cabs, I'm just a generous man. Not just women, men, animals. It's truly a large group that I've, uh, I've, I've, I like to do that. If I, okay. I was a Lyft driver for a night and I had trouble charging people, it's honestly. So can I make that into a really awkward segue into my first question? Let's yep, let's yep. give it a try. The hernia kind of like, okay. Um, you have a book about masculinity. Um, sure. Does paying for people's stuff, is that part of being masculine or break down a little bit of your take of masculinity for our viewers, if you could? Well, I wrote that book a while ago. I have an 11 year old son, but when my wife, got pregnant. I don't even know if that's the right way to say it. When I made her pregnant, when she was a child, I don't know how one does that, but I feel like I was part of it somehow. And we found out she was having a uh, boy. I freaked out. Like, I, just, like, I was, yeah. Uh, there was actually a moment and this uh, gender is so complicated now, but there's a moment where in uh, early on when the, uh, I've, it was so long ago, I forgot the terms, the fetal photos, the amnio, the uh, I don't know the pictures you get. Yeah, uh, in utero. Now I've blanked on that too. Amniocentesis, those photos, the grainy. No, no. Um, sonogram. Megan says a lot of people are suggesting sonogram. Son <laughs> um, <laughs> ultrasound you. has also been suggested. This yes. is a play game. <laughs> <laughs> Megan it really takes a village. About, uh, pregnancy, considering uh, she's uh, doesn't want to. Uh, anyone to partake in it. So um, yeah, my wife was, for a moment we thought we were having a girl and she, my wife freaked out, which was surprising, but we both, I, I felt like I was not capable of raising a boy because I don't know anything about being a man. All my friends were girls when I was little. I had an easy bake oven. I collected glass animals. I love musicals. It just, it, it's not, I don't know how to like, I don't know how a car works. I don't know, you know, what if my son wanted to go like fishing, which he does. I, I just felt really incapable. So I went on, on a journey to try and learn like traditional guy stuff. Like I, uh, I, I first, I just went uh, with the Boy Scouts to become, to earn my first badge on an overnight trip. And then uh, I spent, a, I did an overnight stint with the firefighters in LA, in Hollywood. 
And then eventually I wrestled, um, or didn't wrestle, I fought Randy Couture in a UFC rank. And I did three days of boot camp with the army in Fort Knox. They, they let me pretend to be a soldier. Let me, this guy, General Mark Hurtling, who I've since kind of become friends with, uh, emailed me back and let me fire a tank. I was the only civilian, I think, to fire a tank, which uh, was an experience that the, the captain who let me did it told me it would get not, this is not a metaphor. He told me it would give me a heart on and it, it did not. <laughs> Once again, Samantha is going to, yeah, yes, cut us off of the, I'm yeah, sorry. No, right, Samantha, sorry. you're just, family you're, show, family sorry. show, family Great show, family show, family show, erection, what I meant. So, okay, let us return to the thread then. Okay, and we go and just to, to tee up your, your second book of elitism. So masculinity, you take these big concepts and unpack them. So can you then unpack elitism for our viewers? Yeah, I think when, when a person who normally writes a humor column is writing about politics, it's a bad, bad, you know, the temperature in the water of the country is not good or the world. So yeah, I, I was not intending to write anything about what became a book about politics, but I actually started to write like a funny group of essays and it felt so, this was 2019 when my book came out. So when I, when I was writing that, it felt really insubstantial, unimportant, silly. It just culturally felt dumb. And I realized that I, 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 you had to engage with what was going on. And what was really bothering me was this populist rebellion when people believed that operating from your gut was better than operating from your brain. That someone like Sarah Palin or Donald Trump just kind of knew the right thing to do and the experts stood in the way. And so this was, when I talk about the elite, I'm not talking about the, the 1%, the Nancy Meyer movie, people who have these what was it, Roche Babois? Roche Babois. I thought that was the little uh, uh, bad- Those chocolates, I know. No? I, yeah, and it yes, it's right. Roche Babois, it's the furniture. But what I'm gonna say to you, Joel Stein, that you set yourself up, what's great, as the elitist. So, and viewers of this program are left, right, all over. And are they? what is funny is that you set yourself up as as you say, you're going to a town in Texas called Miami, if I'm right, um, and and that you're going to teach them a few things and whatever. And it's really quite a moving and compelling and surprising and interesting journey. Of, I of now feel like you may have read at least part of my book, which kind of blows me away. Um, uh, or someone, maybe Samantha did, but that's very nice. So yeah, so the when I get freaked out, the night of the 2016 election when Trump won, I got really freaked out, not because the Republican had won, that's happened throughout my life, but because this is the first time a member of the elite had lost an election since probably Andrew Jackson. Right. And I was just I was just afraid of what could happen, just really, really afraid. And when I, when I get afraid, I tr my natural instinct is to try and learn m about the other side, because that, that that usually can calm me down. Like it's usually not quite as bad as my anxiety is projecting because I'm an anxious little Jew. So I went uh, to, I found the county in the country that had the highest percentage of Trump voters. And it was uh, Roberts County, which is this very rural county in the, uh, the um, panhandle of Texas on the very top there. And this town called Miami, spelled Miami. And I spent a week there uh, you know, I got to know probably half the town. There's 500 people there, uh, some, some of whom I still talk to, and uh, and I, I and I got to know why they hate the elite and kind of why they want to overturn the system. And it was uh, it really changed the way I, I think a little bit, and didn't change what I think is best for the world, but it it made me realize why people are unhappy with the current situation. Yeah, and I think that you didn't change your views, but you had such a such a thoughtful pivot to the around the word smug and smugness. Yeah, well, you can tell I am smug. I live in my Nancy Myers house. <laughs> it the, does look pretty nice, actually. I got to say, behind you, it just looks good. Like, but but the word being smug. What can you tell our viewers? What what you discovered around that? Are you feeling about it? 
Well, you know, having kind of a radical curiosity and empathy is difficult. And smugness is just thinking that you're right and you're superior and, and people feel it and people really react to it. And I've spent my whole life being smug. And I think people, I think half of the problem of why people aren't getting vaccines in their arm or why people are doing all kinds of things that make me want to scream is because I'm screaming instead of listening. And, and I think no one wants to take advice from someone who's smug. Your children don't want to, your friends don't want to. You know, when I came home from college and made my parents watch Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead, they didn't want to watch that. That lasted what, 15 minutes? They weren't going to take that from me, right? Because I was, because I had gone to college. Like, so yeah, I think we got to dial that down if we want to, uh, to not have the, you know, the, the, ver the vision of our kind of cosmopolitan global world that's really scaring people. If, if we want to have that come to fruition, then I think uh, we, we have to be a lot more empathetic and listen instead of just telling people why diversity is important and why they have to be anti-racist. Like, I think I, I've had people say, I read, was, like, was this a column in the New York Times? Yes, I read a column that said, people told me to engage Trump voters after the election. I, I engaged one and he still didn't change his mind. So why would I bother? I was like, well, that's not engaging. That's not the goal is that everyone's so busy shaming and trying to change people's minds that, um, that it's, it's not a great moment. So, and finally, I, I think that, I, I mean, you're so funny. Your writing is so laugh out loud funny, but it's also uh, surprisingly soulful for a self-described how you self-describe yourself, which can be hilarious. You, 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 you do not flatter yourself in any way. Um, but I, I think that I, I'm always, your long suffering wife, Cassandra and your son, Lesla, like they are, of course you have to hope for the future, you have a family. Um, and I think that recently you wrote this hilarious New York Times piece about Franken food. Can I call it that? So okay. the new food, can you just tell and, and our, our viewers love to eat? what that experience was? Oh, you know, I've kind of, I am not a vegan or vegetarian, but I, I, I know that I should be like, there's no, I can't make a moral <laughs> argument for why I should, you know, kill animals, torture animals, but I, but I am uh, I'm morally lazy. There's lots of things I can't justify, but I just do it because everyone else is doing it. And I get away with it. So yeah, like, should I have my Nancy Myers house while people don't have money all over the world? No, but I'm just going to do it. So I, uh, I'm looking for a lazy way to kind of be a vegan or vegetarian. And there's now they're, they're making lab made meat. Do you know much about this? Yes, because on the low down sense, yes, that you can make, yes, I know a bit about it before it was. Yeah, so the same way you can like use stem cells to make heart muscles, uh, you can use them to build like parts of Kobe beef if you wanted to and try and, you know, stack them up to re make a steak. So. Uh, and there's other people making kind of proteins. In fact, I, I now eat them like for lunch. I had uh, like a bowl and instead of putting chicken in it, I put like the mycelium that this company from England called corn makes, which is great. It's like ch chicken's pretty close to tasteless. This is pretty close. Uh, yeah, so I found a bunch of foods like that. Like there's some labs that make um, one of the proteins in dairy. So they make ice cream. Graders out of Cincinnati makes a pretty good ice cream out of this stuff. But your family, I think your son, what, what did he think of it? My son was initially not going to play along, but then he saw the dishes that we made and he, and he, he played along. The ravioli was great. That was made with like this kind of fake cream cheese, which is, it's hard to say fake because they're using a real protein that they've, they've gotten. Um, they get a yeast or sometimes E. coli, but not the bad E. coli, to, uh, they introduce uh, genes into it. Is that right? Anyway, it spits out the protein that you're looking for. And then they reuse that, they use that protein. I, I really, you know, when you write something and you kind of understand it, and then you have to explain it to someone else and you realize you don't quite understand it. <laughs> when reading that piece, I felt I sort of understood it, but now that we're thinking about it and the mm -hmm. ravioli, cause like I'm a middle-aged lady. So eating pasta is like a carb thing. Mm -hmm. I can eat meat all day, just not the, so. 
and now Samantha, our, our principal, the principal is back out of the principal's office, which indicates that uh, time may be- any money in her hand. <laughs> you know, come, come for the She's book. She's stiff you, man. Stay She's stiff you, y'all. Twice. Come for the book, stay for the food. Uh, you know, I just wanted to tell you, uh, it's alas, our time has come. Joel. Thank you so much. Megan, thank you so much. Annabelle, thank you so much. David, I don't know what the hell to do with you, but thank you so much <laughs> for coming. And thanks everybody uh, for showing up to Bookish Sandra as always. And I wanna thank our, um, our Reader Reward subscribers again. And thank you to the Bang audience for joining us. People up North, we, we appreciate you uh, joining our hour. Um, Next time on our next episode, April 9th, we'll have Scott Turo, Todd Goldberg, Nina Lawrence Collins, and Jean Hanif Korlitz, who I'm going to ask about her book, the show, uh, The Undoing was based on. Also, I'd like to invite you all. Hey, oh, I'm sorry. Did somebody, did I talk over somebody? No? Okay. Uh, also, I'd like to invite you to our other programs like Garden Party with, with frumpy middle-aged mom columnist uh, Marla Jo Fisher and gardening expert Joshua Siskin, not to mention our Healthy Living Expo. To find out all about that, go to scng.com forward slash virtual events. As always, I encourage you and thank you for reading our newspapers and visiting our websites to stay informed and equally important, to be entertained. If you'd like to share your thoughts about today or have any questions about the show, please email us. Or if you have ideas, please email us at events at scng.com. Have a great weekend, everybody. See you next time. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.